We're good? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Haley Scott. I'm a student in the English department here at UVU, and I'm from Gilbert, Arizona. We welcome you to the thematic session, Sustainable Development Goal Number 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. SDG 11 focuses on making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Today, as moderator for this panel, we have Dr. Inigo Arbiol, Director of Master in International Relations and Business Diplomacy in the University of Deusto, De De Usto? Bilbao, Spain. The panelists include Dr. Victor Ucorbi, President and CEO of Build a School Initiative in Africa, Ms. Sophia Nicholas, Deputy Director of the Sustainable Department at Salt Lake City Corporation, and Kylie Schuyler, Executive Director of Global Glow, Girls Leading Our World. Now I will turn the time to Dr. Arbiol. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kylie. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone, for uh, joining us in this session. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, moderate this uh, panel on SDG 11 on uh, sustainable cities and, and communities, right? Um, but the relevance of, uh, of this SDG is, well, we know that uh, since 2007, right, uh, more than 50% uh, of the population have been turned into urban residents, right? That's has increased the relevance of sustainable, safe, adequate, right, uh, cities and communities to, to, to be, re um, to be um, managed, right? Uh, issues like air pollution, waste management, infrastructures, transportation, right? In order to have people uh, enjoy better lives in their cities and communities, that's that's uh, so. Uh, recently, for example, we knew that 90% of the urban residents. Uh, it's a calculation that 90%, around 90% of the residents live in urban areas with polluted air in the world. Right. So there, there are lots of challenges. Right. And 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 it's a reality that cities occupy like 3% of Earth's land but they consume 60% of the resources and 70%, uh, they produce 70% of the global carbon emissions. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, to talk uh, and, and to consider that there's definitely this SDG matters a lot, right? And uh, looking into the future, we know that by 2050, right, um, seven out of 10 people, right, will be living in urban areas or areas around urban uh, communities, right? So. Uh, a lot has been done, right? And we will talk about that today, right? Monitoring, reporting, uh, uh, and the specific SDGs connected with uh, with cities and communities and the territories, right? Voluntary national, uh, sorry, uh, voluntary local reviews, right? Uh, cities, but also local and regional governments are doing that. We've got examples of that, very good ones, right? And, and obviously, um, this is uh, this is what brings us here, right? To promote socially and environmentally sustainable towns, cities, and communities, right? So, how do we do that, right? By bringing or scaling down uh, the conversation to the local, uh, to the local communities, right? That's why today, and I'm not taking more time uh, um, by making introductions, right? We have these uh, three amazing panelists here with us. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining us, right? And um, they have an incredible vast experience, right? You can check that online and uh, a lot of knowledge to share, right? We're going to start with uh, Victor, Victor Ukorevi here uh, from Nigeria, who is uh, the president of the Build a School Initiative, right? So, Victor, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And what a great blessing it is to be part of this panel. And most importantly, to talk about something so dear and so close to my heart. And I really look forward to a wonderful conversation with my colleagues here who, are, who has vast experience in this field that we're going to talk about. So my name is Victor Okorebi. I was born and raised in Nigeria. And I currently work for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as Area Temple Facilities Manager. 
And because of this opportunity to work for the church in this capacity, I've actually traveled to so many cities and so many communities to work with the people. And some of the things that I see really make me to start to wonder, are there more that we can do for our people? Can we make our cities and our communities sustainable, resilient, safe, and inclusive? And it's something that I've been constantly worried about. So my wife and I and our little children lived in Lagos, Nigeria. You can imagine Lagos is a very big city with over more than 20 million people. So one time we came to the United States and went to Europe and enjoyed a very wonderful vacation. So on our way back, we were flying back into the crazy and busy airport of Lagos. And my little boy, Monson, who at that time was about less than five years old, sat by the window of the aircraft. And you know what happened when the plane is descending? They love to just sit through the window to enjoy the beautiful scenery of the city. But I noticed that as Monson was gazing down the city of Lagos, he became so confused, so worried, and disturbed. And he turned to me and said, Dad, why is Lagos so old? And at that moment, I did not completely understand what Monson meant, that Lagos was so old. Growing up, Lagos was my London, was my New York, was this city that I really loved. But Monson, having traveled to some of these, what I would call smart cities, saw the way things were so organized and was wondering, why is Nigeria, why is Lagos so disorganized? He saw probably the architectural landscape of how disorganized it was, poor transportation system, and he began to be so worried about it. And yet, Lagos is supposed to be the largest and the fastest growing metropolitan city in Africa. So it was, you know, he wanted to see Salt Lake, London, New York, in Lagos. So the question is, are there more that we can do? What role can we play to make this happen? So I want to agree with Monson that yes, some of our biggest cities are getting old, not well maintained, and then we need to do something to move it forward. So it matters to us that big cities like Lagos, like Mumbai, like Kinshasa, like even uh, uh, Mexico City, that these cities are able to work harder to ensure that by 2030, they meet the sustainable development goals. So when my wife and I lived in Lagos, each time we take our children to one of the international schools around us, she would see children on the street who were supposed to be in classrooms. They are not. She became so worried. And then she said, what can we do? These kids are just lining the street every day, and the number is increasing. And they are begging for harms, begging for food, and sometimes causing trouble. And then we decided to come together to start build a school initiative in Africa. It was very simple, very simple idea. Just work with the communities, work with the government, and then work with other non-for-profit organizations to add additional block of classrooms to the existing public schools. And in that way, we can start to gradually take these little children off from the street to take them into classrooms. Now you may be wondering, how did they end up on the streets? It's very simple. Most of these people were living in rural areas in villages. And they are moving to the cities for greener pastures. And then they went with their parents, and the classrooms are so crowded, and there is nowhere for them to receive education. And what they do is just to roam the streets. So in our own little way, of trying to sustain, I mean, to support the SDG 11 is to partner with the government to reduce the number of heart of school children. So just with my opening remarks, I think there's still more to do. What we are doing is just barely scratching the surface. Within three years, we've done more than 10 classrooms, 10 blocks of classrooms in Nigeria, more than five in Togo, and four in Benin Republic. With our other partners, we've also spread to Zambia, to Malawi. 
Our goal is to ensure that we work with the government to reduce this number of out of school children. I think our children deserve a better place. Even though they are in these big cities, we can still accommodate them. So I want to start by saying, yes, we have a role to play. This is not something we leave for just the government alone to do. We need to partner with them and see what we can do to move forward. So I would like to stop here and give my other members of the panel opportunity to also introduce themselves. And then I look forward to answering more questions about how we can together do this. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm just uh, passing the floor maybe to you, Sophia. Sophia Nicholas is Deputy Director of Salt Lake City Sustainable uh, Development. Hi, so Sophia. Great, thank you. It's so wonderful to be here. My name is Sophia Nicholas. Um, as uh, he mentioned, I'm, I'm the Deputy D Director of our Sustainability Department in Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City is the capital city of Utah. Uh, we are only about 200,000 residents, so definitely not Lagos or any of those mega cities. Although, of course, our metropolitan area along the Wasatch Front is much bigger. And in 2019, we were honored to host the 68th United Nations Civil Society Summit at the Salt Palace, and I was involved with some of the planning and some of the uh, events there, so it's really exciting to be back. So, I think that it's, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the role of cities in building strong communities and to break down what sustainable cities really means from my perspective working in, in Utah in a developed country in the United States. So sustainability means more than just the environment. It means having a balanced, prosperous economy, having a balanced and flourishing society, and of course protecting future generations as well as present generations and the natural world. So all of those things ideally are in balance in order to have a sustainable city. And why cities? Cities are in many places around the world, certainly in the United States, they're the closest form of government to the people. And they are, they touch, cities and communities touch people every day. So we're collecting the trash, we're ensuring it's properly disposed of, we're providing clean water, we're carrying away wastewater, we're clearing snow from the streets and ensuring that we have uh, functioning transportation networks. We're responding to emergencies, fire, safety, natural disaster, and more. We're developing and managing parks and green space. We're attracting economic development. I could go on and on, um, <laughs> and, I, and I will. <laughs> um, and in some cities like Salt Lake City, we manage the airport. So the Salt Lake City International Airport is one of our departments. We, we have an arts council, so we're supporting the, 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 the public art and that, that importance in our community. And then in my job, I get to work on bringing those two together, sustainable and cities, to develop policies and programs that really help us have a flourishing uh, uh, community as it relates to, to sustainability. So, we are very lucky in that we, that we live in a very prosperous country, prosperous state, prosperous city, but there are a few things in common that I can see between my work in Salt Lake City and, and, with, country, and with, with cities around, around the country, or around the world, uh, specifically related to the environment. And that has to do with climate change, air pollution, water availability, and waste management. And we can talk about more of that in, in the question and answer. Um, but I sometimes get asked, why should local government work on climate change? Because this is, this is one of the biggest things that our department does. Isn't, it the, isn't this a national and an international problem? What can you really do at the local level? And I, my answer to that is that, first of all, local governments are the ones that are on the front lines responding to the effects of climate change. So we're starting to see this more and more as the years go by, right? We're experiencing wildfires, extreme storms, drought, we're trying to figure out how we're going to get water to everyone who lives in our communities, um, economic impacts, right? So we can see in Utah just our, our ski industry, our brine shrimp industry, the Great Salt Lake. So we're, we're facing these impacts here and now, and local governments are uh, really responsible for trying to figure out what to do about them. And we can also play a role in, in helping to address climate change. And, and we have a a lot of ways that we're doing that in Salt Lake City, and I've seen examples across the country, but one thing 
my, my favorite example at the moment is our community renewable energy program. And this is something that we worked uh, with the state legislature, with our investor-owned utility, Rocky Mountain Power, to uh, pass state law to change the way that, that cities can work with Rocky Mountain Power to meet our 100% clean electricity goals. And it's the first of its kind program in the state, I think in the country as well. And it's a great example of the power of collaboration. And what we're doing is um, working across 18 local governments with Rocky Mountain Power to develop enough renewable energy to meet our annual electricity needs across the whole community. And I think it's just such a good living demonstration of how we're working across government, we're working with NGOs, we're working with state government, we're working with private industry, and of course we're working with um, the public who has really demanded that, that in Salt Lake City's case that we take action on renewable energy and climate change. So I want to just finish off by saying that we do better when we work together. And local government, civil society, academics, youth, we all play a critical role. And what this conference is about and what uh, this conversation is about is I think how we can all come together to contribute to our community, to contribute to sustainable cities, both for our local benefit as well as for our global impact. So thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sophia. Uh, our next speaker, next panelist is Kyler Skyler, uh, and she's the founder director and executive chair of um, a Global Girls Leading Our World, right? And, yes. um, and I'm, it's, it's a pleasure to pass you the floor, Great. right? Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'm gonna start way, way, way back when I was 12, because the story really starts there. When I was 12 years old, I was starting to become a young woman and feeling that feeling of being uncomfortable, not knowing who I was, trying to figure that out, and having a lot of worries, and also getting the messages from society that somehow being a girl of 12 was not that great, and boys had more power than I did. Already I knew. I felt outside, outside the, 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 the seat at the table, let's say. So it was not really a surprise that in 2006, when I was in Cambodia, so many, many, many years later, doing some community service, service work outside of Phnom Penh, that I saw a little girl standing outside of a fence, outside of a school, looking in, peering in, with her fingers sort of laced through the chain link fence, and noting her face, just the longing look that she was not being brought into that school. Other kids were coming in, and at that time, it, I realized mostly boys were being brought into that school, and I saw that, and it profoundly struck me. So from that day, I, lo I learned later, her name is Sray Lynn, I made sure I knew about that girl from that day. I did have done everything in my power to bring Sray Lynn and girls like her into the school and give them the opportunities that only were reserved for boys often and around the world as we know. So Sri Lynn has been my North Star and I've done work in many, many, many ways, including founding the nonprofit Global Glow, which now operates around the world in 31 countries. We have 20,000 girls in our programs and what we do with them is we give them the tools to be able to advocate for themselves to be strong. So the way that this works for them is they become strong, obviously. They are changed by, the, by their experience with us. They change their families, as we know. They change their communities, as we know. And what happens with those girls is they rise to be leaders in their community. And what happens in the community, the communities become much stronger themselves the girls become leaders. They look out in the community and see what needs to be done and just naturally move toward those things. We don't ask them to go do that. It's, it comes from their own inner strength. We've noted that if girls are given voice and agency, then, there, then comes power. 
And so for, for us, it's been astounding to watch the girls do this in their communities and watch communities change, watch cultural biases change, watch gender norms change, and girls are being kept in school rather than taken out. So it's been my life goal to see that happen, and it's happening with Global Glow. I've taken this whole idea to another level because I realize that it's nice to, to do work on the ground, of course. We work with community leaders all over the world, and it's a wonderful network of strong women and men and girls and everyone pulling together for this common goal to raise the voices of girls. It's become clear to me, though, that we cannot make change happen fast enough if we only operate that way. So what I've done is I've launched a new foundation where we are now giving grants to girl-focused organizations around the world. Um, the, the, the grants are being funded by a business that I started that you will soon hear more about because it's a consumer package, a good product that will be in your supermarket soon. And so I, I'm gonna promote that really heavily tonight so, or today so you all will make sure you see it in the supermarkets. It carries the message of girls' empowerment on the packaging and 100% of its profits go toward girl-focused organizations around the world. So it's rising up uh, out, of, out of the just the operational in, on, in the grassroots way to operate at a higher level because I know that making girls strong, and if there's one thing that you'll hear from me today, it's I believe that girls are the best investment to make communities, cities, sustainable, resilient, safe, healthy. Girls are the best investment we can make for our future. We also know, and of course I have to say this, girls are also dis disproportionately impacted by all the problems that communities face including poverty, including crime, including gender-based violence in all its forms, um, climate change, all the parts, all the things that we're discussing here, they're disp disproportionately impacted by, and, 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 and their situation is, is exacerbated by anything that's a disruption in, in our world. So war or COVID or you know, all the other parts, girls suffer disproportionately. The good news is, as I've said, girls are also the solution. So when girls have a voice and can advocate for their, themselves and their communities, they make things happen. Positive change happens. They are change makers. And we know as they grow into uh, strong girls growing into strong women, we know that women have a very uh, powerful, powerful voice when it comes to climate change. We know that leaders that, countries that have uh, women leaders, they have stricter climate change um, standards. They have other ways that they are looking at their community, the way they spend their, their disposable income. They spend it on their children, health. It's, it's a rising ripple effect when a woman has power. So I'll end there, and I would love to, I'm going to love to hear questions. Um, of course, I'd love to tell you more about my nonprofit, of course, and also the product that is going to fund what I think will be uh, millions and millions of dollars of funding for girls around the world. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. We really want to know about that, right? <laughs> in the specifics of, 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 the, of your ideas. Um, good. Um, well, I'll, I'll take the opportunity as a moderator to make a quest, the first question, right? And then I really want uh, to save time to, uh, for the audience to, to make questions back. Seems to me that in your interventions, right, the um, common, common spaces, common ideas about SDG 11 being like preparing in a specific space for the rest of the SDGs to happen, right? It's, um, say it's like, uh, you talked about gender equality, you talk about education, uh, fighting against inequality, uh, about uh, getting public resources organized to serve the people directly, right? With the, not from the macro, but from the micro, close to the people, partnerships, talked about partnerships, right? So it seems like local spaces were the real magic 
can 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 happen right with real people inspired by SDGs right so my, my question in this debate about the micro and the the macro and the micro right it's you all do but why we should be working more at the local level right what are the advantages of doing that way if you can elaborate uh, any any of you or all of you <laughs> Okay, so let me get us started on this. Thank you for that great question. Well, with Build a School Initiative in Africa, we kind of carefully evaluated the impact that we wanted to create in the communities and in the societies. I mean, we have a group of people who are always quick to blame the leadership, but less about themselves. So we do better, just like Sophia said, when we work together as a team. So when we go to provide a block of maybe four classrooms to a particular community, we want them to come work with us. We want to partner together so they can take ownership. This is for them. So we've seen that we are more successful when we work with the local communities than trying to do it alone. And then the question is, what can I do to help my people? How can I support them than just sitting down and doing the blame game? So we've really seen that very helpful. And then the second one is leadership, leadership, and leadership. We need more leaders who will be deliberate and willing to make that change happen. Without that, we cannot go to any where we plan to be. So another thing that I really thought about why we should involve the local people is that they are the primary people that will enjoy from whatsoever success we achieve. So we begin to create that awareness and to help them change the orientation that no matter how little it is, they can contribute to making our communities safe. And if our communities are safe, we'll have many people from outside the developing world that can come and say, okay, let me partner with you and support this cause. Let's take, for example, if I say, I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to Africa West or West Africa in about three days. If I say, are you ready to go with me? There will be somebody that says, no, I'm so scared, it's not safe. But what role does the government have to play in this to make our communities safe so we can start drawing investors, start in drawing other partners to work with us? Because experience has taught us that we cannot do it alone. We can't go far enough if we are moving alone. But when we work together in partnership, we can actually achieve a lot. Thank you. I'll just say that um, I work in local government, so I very much this is my this is my world, and I can tell you that um, our elected officials, city staff, I mean, we really are here to serve our our, our residents and our businesses and our community. So um, we respond to your concerns, to your questions, to your requests. It might not seem like that all the time, but I can I can tell you that. Um, it's it's a huge part of the of the work we do, and I know that we wouldn't in my department be able to 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 do um, the work we do on on environmental issues and sustainability without that strong um, urging of our community as well as the elected officials. So I know that it can feel like politics is really negative. Um, it might not seem like you can make a difference, um, and. I just encourage everyone to get involved at all levels, but particularly realize the impact that you can have at that local level. So what happens with us is we have girls who are operating in their communities doing work, and the stories that come from those communities then are broadcast, and we amplify those stories. Luckily, we have a a strong relationship with the UN, UN women, and the girls themselves have come to the UN to talk about what's gone on in their communities as well. So the local action that's taken, taking place in their communities gets broadcast around the world and inspires others. So the girls that are operating, let's say, in Kathmandu, Nepal, then are talking to girls who are in um, just outside of Nairobi and telling them, this is what we did in our community, and those girls are inspired by that. 
So I think that, as we've said here, I think working together, you start at the local level, but you're working together by inspiring other great work in other communities, as long as we're doing good storytelling. So I have a couple um, stories just that I've seen uh, recently, where we've seen girls operating in groups, usually the girls do really wonderful work in collaborative ways. We have a group of girls that um, out in rural Peru that were impacted by the fact that they didn't have running water in their community and they were having to wait at home and kept out of school because they had to wait for the water to be delivered. And they said, we can't have this. We need to go right now and to our municipality and make sure that they do something about this. And they lobbied for that running water to be installed in their, in their community. So that, that happened and it changed their community. We have girls that saw the, the problem of um, uh, gender-based violence, really, in Uttar Pradesh in India, and they started to put together workshops so people would talk about that. We have girls who helped to clean up the water waterways in Detroit, who sent the story out nationwide about what they were doing and inspired other girls and to, to do something similar in their community. So, in my, in my view, in my world, when we work locally, we tell the story of that, we make sure other people know and inspire each other. Thank you so much. I just want to share another experience that I had a few months ago. So we just completed a block of classroom in Nigeria, and then we turned this over to the government. And during the handing over event, this little girl came, and thank you for talking about girls, she came and said, why do you do the things you're doing? And at the time, I was so blank without knowing what answer to give to her. But I just responded, change starts with me. You know, I just want to do what I can. And I invited her, when you grow up and you are rich, can you do what we're doing? I said, yes, I would love to. And she was so excited about the opportunity that she has been taught that no matter how little she has, she can give back. So the lesson I took away from that experience is that we don't have to be super wealthy to give back to the society or to promote the cause of making our cities and communities safer for people to reside in. And I took that away and said, you know what, we need to do more of this. Create the awareness and teach people patiently. It may not happen overnight, but we can start as little as we can to teach them one by one until they catch the vision and can become partners in promoting this. Yeah, that's that's really very interesting point, right? And um, on that, right, it's what would be the main challenge uh, that um, you face, right, to scale the effects of what you do, right? And in different fields, right? Uh, you work in education, you work in, uh, on gender uh, and, and gender quality promotion, right? So in different civil society from the public, uh, local institution perspective, right? What would be the main challenge, right? And maybe awareness or partnerships. So what do you think it's your main challenge is? If there is only one, right? I guess there are lots of them, right? But what would you say it's uh, the, that, that space where you can, uh, you know, really scale the effect of what you do? I can speak quickly to that. Funding is going to be the number one thing, of course. And for, for me in my work, um, empowering girls, it's startling to hear that of the charitable dollars in the US, many of us know this, they say under 2% go to women particularly. So to girls, they think it's under 0.5% of all charitable dollars in the US are directed to girls. So what I've said to you is I think girls are the best investment. We need to convince individuals, corporations, foundations, and governments that we need to invest in those girls rather than have it be such a minuscule amount. Yes, <laughs> I echo that. Um, I think 
in the work that, that, that I do, which is focused on a lot dealing with renewable energy, climate change, air pollution. We also work on uh, recycling policy, uh, local food and food security. Um, it's certainly a matter of, of, of scaling up. And, and, and of course, it's a resource question. It would be great to continue to have resources um, to help us do that. But I think, I think having the, the, the local solutions, the state level solutions, and there is definitely a place for the federal and international support, um, which we have gotten some very exciting um, new developments with, with the recent um, laws that were passed, the Inflation Reduction Act and the um, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which is going to transform the, 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 sector, the sectors here in the United States around climate change and um, economic development. So um, I think, I don't know that it's a necessarily a, a, just a challenge, but um, continuing to, to partner and, and build from each other. And I can say just one quick exciting thing that we just launched this week actually. Um, there's a lot of attention at the government level, at the at the business level, um, the NGO level around renewable energy and climate mitigation efforts. Um, but we are increasingly aware that we also need to find ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the air um, because we have put so much into it that we need to look at that uh, those solutions as well. Um, there's some um, business and federal support for this carbon dioxide removal uh, strategies. Um, the company Stripe, which works on financial transactions, pledged a million dollars back in 2019 for this. They had a bunch of their customers, other um, um, businesses say, hey, can we just give you money to help us figure out how to invest in these technologies? Because it, we've been looking for how to get involved to make a difference. And, and, and three years later, they have close to a billion dollars now that they're managing. Salt Lake City just joined a, a regional partnership um, between Santa Fe, New Mexico, Flagstaff, Arizona, and Boulder County, Colorado to do the same thing at a regional level. So right now, Salt Lake City is, is, is in a learning mode, um, but I think it's just a, 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 in participating in the, the applications from these companies that we can support. But I think it's a good example of how we can scale at all these different kinds of levels to, to do what we need to do, so. But thank you. I think in addition to funding, I'm also beginning to think that perhaps we need to do more in creating awareness for the people to know what is going to happen globally. For example, the influx of people from rural villages to some of these urban areas, cities, and communities is just growing. And this is going to be like a never-ending problem in our hands. So according to the UN report, they have estimated that 35% of urbanization will occur in three major countries, India, China, and Nigeria. So are they ready for what is going to happen between 2018 and 2050? If you look at the place like Nigeria, for example, in 2010, they had less than 10 million people, but just within 10 years, they've almost doubled that number in Lagos. So what is this doing to our children? Do they have places to go to school? Are we taking this into consideration to also accommodate them? So I think we're just barely scratching the surface. I think there's still more that we can do. So as a result of that, I support what you've said about funding. I think we also need key partners to be able to make this happen. And as soon as we come together and getting more people working with us to make this happen, I think we'll start you know, succeeding and making the progress that we are thinking of making. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I promise to, to save time for questions. So I, I'll start my, my list of uh, issues. And, and the, the, we've got a microphone over there for anyone who wants to make a question to any of the panelists, right? LC, there's uh, over there, right? And I, I, okay. So if um, if you could just identify yourself and uh, and you know, uh. hello, I'm Nick and I live in American Fork, Utah, just a little bit north of here. Um, thank you for for all your remarks. Um, 
luckily, American Fork is a city that has clean running water, has excellent infrastructure, great schools. Um, the issue is not that we have too many children on our streets um, with nowhere to go, um, but that there's not a human being on our streets. There's, there's no one, in fact. It's a very lonely place. It doesn't feel like a community at all. Um, and I'm trying to work with the city council to promote active transportation and make the city more walkable, more livable, more human. Um, because that element is, is lacking, and I fear for that for, for cities around the world that are developing, moving into the world. You might get to a place where, where all you see are Dodge Ram 2500s and, and not a soul. Um, what's the best way to, because the funding exists now at the federal level for these projects with these new laws that were passed by Congress, how can I, how can I help the city see, the city council specifically see that that human element is missing? That a child can't walk down the street to the park because there's no sidewalk. How do I, how do I explain that to them? Change, make a change. Thank you. And I'm going to sit down and take notes. So. Yes, I, I very much um, appreciate your your thoughts there. Um, I think here in Utah, the we're experiencing a lot of growth as well. Not as much as um, Nigeria. I don't think, but uh, but but we are facing these challenges, right? With with the way that we've built and designed a lot designed a lot of our cities, um, that they are getting busier, that they're getting more um, that you know the lifestyles that we've been able to to have are it's it's causing more congestion, more air pollution, less community in terms of um, you know people being able to feel safe and using other forms of transportation, as well as just being out in the community and that, that place-making element. So um, I know in Salt Lake City, it's, you know, it's in part just because our community has realized that we need to do something different to, to solve those other challenges as well. Um, the status quo isn't going to work into the, 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 the coming decades. I also think that, um, you know, having, uh, if, if there's children, parents, in your community that you can help organize to go speak uh, at the, the city council, at the forums that, that these topics are being discussed, that's really powerful. Um, I know also in Rose Park, which is a, a neighborhood in Salt Lake City, some parents are organizing a, a bike bus of, um, of students who want to uh, be able to bike to school more safely, and so they're organizing to do it together um, to be able to, to do that. We've also had some community groups that have encouraged Salt Lake City, really urged Salt Lake City to lower its speed limit on residential streets from 25 down to 20 miles per hour. Um, just to say, you know, these, these streets are, these are for, they, they really are for walking and biking and people, not just for cars driving probably 30 or 40 miles per hour on them. So I, I think taking it and telling the stories and connecting those stories directly with, with your decision makers and you probably will have to do it a few more times. Um, well, will help. So. Sorry, I lost the mic. Um, so, uh, I just, uh, well, okay, go ahead and I'll repeat it for the ones online. For those at home, he asked on how to bring people, right? Uh, and and not, just, uh, not just a few, but everyone, being more inclusive with all communities and, and all type of people, right? Um, does anyone want to address that point? No, I, I am going to go back to my thinking that the youth are really the answer. And I, I don't know if everyone agrees with that, but when I'm with the, the young people, the young girls, the young women that work with us, I see that things are much more inclusive and much more equitable, and there is a, an eye to that. So when, when I come with my old you know, view of the world, they have a different one. So I have hope with this. 
and I hope other people do that as well. But I do think youth coming into that conversation the way that Sophia mentioned is really the way families, youth, children to come in and make sure that they are heard by the, the government officials. Thank you. I just want to add um, to what Sophia said. Yeah. I think we need to carefully see how we can continue to teach and invite others to act. Sometimes it looks so difficult, but patiently doing that can start bringing people on the same table with us to start making these key decisions. Now, let me also mention two important things, and I'll be very careful as I do so. I think it starts by voting right and electing the right people to represent us, people who are willing to catch the vision and see what we would like them to get done for us because they represent us. And secondly, I'm just gonna say, I'll be a little bit religious here. <laughs> we need to pray for our leaders. We need to support them the very best that we can, that as they represent us, they are making the right decisions that can cause positive change, that our people can see and be better off because of the decision that they've made. And I think that can help us as we move forward. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we've got another question over there, Elsie. Thank, I want to thank the panel very much for the information they have given. Um, but when I, I, I think of clean, clean and sustainable cities, my question is, how do we support the cities to be clean? Because this is a big problem, you know, especially for us in Africa. And it cannot, it cannot just be left to the city council. How do we mobilize people, sensitize them to be a part of clean and sustainable cities? Because without that, people are going to fall sick, people are going to die. I mean, I, I, I always, I went to India once and I was like, there are so many. How do they manage to keep their cities clean? Can we know what they do? How do they arrive at that? You arrive at a hospital, there are about 3,000 3, people there that day, but you don't hear a single noise. How do they manage it? I mean, a, 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 my first experience going to West Africa, I stayed for one week without eating. It was impossible because everywhere was just, you know, I'm sorry to you, I don't even know what word to use it, but it was impossible to eat because of the stench that came out from some of the places. How do we manage to keep the cities clean and sustainable. For me, that is a big question that we must address. Thanks for your question. Anyway, you want to address that? Uh, I mean, I work in, in Utah, and, and, and um, uh, as we've discussed, we, we are fortunate to have good governance structures and good regulatory oversight, and I think I think that is absolutely necessary um, in order to create the, 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 the systems and the, the um, standards and the enforcement to have clean, sustainable cities um, at the very basic level. Um, I don't have a great answer for you because I, I, I'm not an expert um, internationally. I, I guess I would say that there is a lot of power to uh, community groups, to families, to mothers, to young girls seeing a problem and deciding, I'm gonna try to figure out how I can act on this at the, at the very specific neighborhood level. I think, broadly speaking, there's also a, a really important role for, for a good, free, strong press that can help cover these issues and help identify corruption or mismanagement or problems so that that can be something that 
that is a shared awareness among the public so that those solutions can be identified and organized around at uh, multiple local levels. But thank you. That's a great question. I can relate to that. <laughs> so um, again, this starts with us. And this is a shared responsibility between the government and the people. The government has a role to play to keep the cities clean. But that does not eliminate our own personal responsibilities as well. We need to start teaching from our homes that our children do not let our environment. And then there's something unique that we do in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Every year we get together as a group of maybe local congregation to go render services to our communities. And they do that every year and they come out in their numbers to clean and to keep the place decent for people to dwell in those cities. And then I remember doing this many years ago as a full-time missionary for the church. We we'll go out and just render service to people and just clean and do the best that we can. So that is what we can do on our own to promote this and to actively get involved in keeping our cities clean. And then again, no matter what we've done, the government must play their own part because it gets so bad and so difficult that even the people cannot do it alone without the support of the government. Thank you. I, I have another innovative answer because one of our partners actually in India has a program that they have the youth and the community involved in. They call it social capital credits or SOCs. And what happens is a problem like you've identified, they will give a social capital credit for anyone helping to solve that problem. And basically what it is, is they keep track of people who are helping and then that they can trade their capital credits for things they need or want. And it, it actually works really very well. Communities work together and it's, it's quite innovative. So something like that problem would actually work well with this innovative solution where let's say uh, the community gathered or, the, or a group gathered around and went out and did some work to clean up the community. And in, in turn, they were given a, a social capital credit for let's say a reduced bus pass or, or something else that the community has identified as valuable. I, I cannot resist the temptation of saying something to you. <laughs> I shouldn't, but um, I, I think um, it's important to make also people part of the why, meaning uh, a cleaner, in, in the case of uh, uh, clean cities, right, or communities, it's also about safer children. It's also about healthier uh, older people. It's about, um, you know, friends who can have any type of limitation living in a better, uh, in a better condition. So improved cities is improved lives. It's as simple as that, right? So uh, I think it's not just from the government to do, Right? It's, maybe it's the other way around. It's if, if we transform this into public claim because we understand that better cities and cleaner cities and uh, it's, it's definitely better lives for us, we will then push the governments to take action too and make them accountable, right? Other way around is something that can be perceived as imposed or artificial or not needed, right? Or not connected to my basic needs as a father or as a brother or as a citizen or as a member of the community, right? Sorry for adding. Um, we can take uh, uh, one more question if, if somebody wants to. Uh, um, uh, you ready for the question there? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Relay Abram. I am a, um, an older student here at UVU studying criminal justice. Um, I, I've, lived in, or I've lived in Utah for the last um, five years, but I am from Denver, Colorado, where I live 19 years. My question is, um, um, so I've seen in Salt Lake where uh, the sustainable living, they've, they've come in and they've taken older parts of the city and they have uh, changed them and made them more organized and um, more walkable, more livable, uh, safer. Um, in Denver, I've noticed many, many cities that have been changing and um, 
you know, making these more sustainable, but in the process they are uh, pricing out the poor and um, also the homeless um, are finding, uh, you know, if there isn't any place to stay for them, the shelters are being reduced um, around the country um, in general, but the sustainable cities are pricing out these low-income people and um, I, I just, my question is kind of, you know, what is, what is the, um, what are the considerations for these, um, you know, as these cities are changing and, and developing into these, uh, you know, walkable communities with, uh, that are growing in price, in price range, um, what are the considerations for those that are um, of lower income that are being priced out and they're having to move further and further away. And as we know with Utah, um, the transportation is not all that great, but um, they're finding it harder to find places to, um, to live and um, it's making it very, very difficult for them and their families. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes, this is a this is a tough this is a tough um, reality that we're facing in Salt Lake City and Utah across the Wasatch Front and uh, definitely in, in other places across the country. Um, where Salt Lake City is actually finishing up an anti gentrification analysis right now that we've hired some expert consul consultants to help us with. And one of the things they found that they have not seen in any of their other cities around the country that they've studied, including the Bay Area and Seattle area is that every single census tract except for one along the Wasatch Front is experiencing displacement because of price pressures. So this isn't just a Salt Lake City thing, it's not just a Salt Lake County thing. This is something that, that we have a, a problem with across the Wasatch Front because there's, we're losing out on where people can go. Um, and it is, it, is, it is a challenge because we're, making our communities, we're creating assets in our communities, we're creating development in our communities, but yes, that, that is having an impact on that naturally occurring affordable housing. So, I, you know, there, there's no, there's no I'm, not an, I'm not an expert in that I can just tell you, oh, here's the, the we're, we're gonna wave the magic wand and it, we're gonna solve this problem. I can tell you that we're very much aware of it and working on it, and it definitely has to do with balancing affordable housing density with our growth. And that doesn't mean that we have density everywhere. It means that we have density in more places around transit, around um, um, uh, other transportation systems, around places that, um, that, that, that are more suitable. It, it looks like having more missing middle housing, so accessory dwelling units, um, row houses, uh, um, all of those types of solutions for, for our, our community because it's growing and we're, and we're landlocked in some ways, right? So that's, that's one answer. Um, but I think there is a movement across the country for the yes in my backyard instead of the no, not in my backyard. So let's think about how we can be welcoming to new people who are here, whether it's our children, whether it's people immigrating in, and how we can continue to grow because it is affecting all of us. Um, growth is positive, it brings a lot of benefits, but there's, there's these other things that are downsides to growth which have to do with, with affordable housing, with air pollution, with homelessness that um, are very much top of mind that we need to balance as well. Sophia, um, just an additional question to that. It seems like every time I, I, I ask this question, I get the same response. And you know my apologies, but it's just um, I I wonder what, for instance, Salt Lake. What are they? Um, what do you have brewing in the pot to deal with this problem? What have you guys discussed to help deal with this particular issue? Because I understand Utah is growing. We're having more and more people moving in, but the families that are still here um, that have very low incomes, they, they're being pushed out and they, they're finding it hard to afford. So what, what things have been discussed 
within like the city councils or the state uh, on how to address this. Um, I mean, even small considerations, like just some ideas, because I, I keep hearing, you know, the same thing. We're not. Thank you. We're not moving yeah. forward. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. And, and again, um, it, it's all in, in how can we preserve existing housing? How can we develop more affordable housing? How can we increase the housing stock across all um, levels of, of market share? Is, and, and there's a lot of things that the city's doing, the state's doing. Um, it's not, it's, it, there needs to be more of it, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, thank you very much. We've run out of time. Uh, and uh, so I would like to take just a few seconds to thank the three of you a lot for your interventions, for uh, the work you do, right? Which really works on, on creating and, and sustaining uh, sustainable cities and communities, thanks a lot. And I would like to uh, ask for, um, for a round of applause for these uh, three wonderful panelists. Thank you very much.